Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Studio 78 Podcast. I am your host, Nishé from NishéSnow.com. Welcome to episode 105. I have Kaylin Marcotte on here from Jiggy Puzzles. I'm really excited to share her story with you. But of course, so a few housekeeping items. Of course, for the show notes, just head on over to nishaysnow.com slash 105. Please rate the podcast five stars on Apple Podcasts. That helps people find the show. If you're listening to this on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And of course, on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe there too. All right. And to support the podcast, please head on over to nishaysnow.com slash Skillshare. You can get two months free. Not only can you get access to my class, how to organize your life to make time for your passion, you get access to a ton of amazing courses. Learn how to hand letter. There's leadership courses over there. There's Anything you can think of, workout stuff, I mean, you name it, it's over there and it's created by entrepreneurs like you and me and, you know, people who aren't even entrepreneurs that just want to share their information, but great high quality videos and they're really super quick and easy. So you can learn something in 20 minutes or less, which is really nice. So please head Even, of course, you know, my class is longer because, you know, that's just me. (laughs) But head on over to nishaysnow.com slash Skillshare, and it'll take you right there so you can sign up and get your two months for free. Okay, let's get back to Kaylin. I think you guys are going to be so pumped when you all listen to this episode because... I think she is a good example of what happens when you actually do the thing you want to do or you say you're going to do. You know how you always have that idea for something? I'm guilty of this too. And it's like, oh, somebody should create X and then you never do it and you're not that somebody. Well, she had one of those ideas too, but she did it. And I think you'll be just inspired by her story. Um, It's just really exciting how she took a puzzle that's been around forever and made it more artsy and designery from the packaging to the art that's on it to actually making it where you can frame it like she has like glue you could put on it to actually you know, set it in place and then you can frame it. And so she really thought through how she wanted this to be different from your traditional puzzle. And she worked to get it done. So kudos to her. Really inspiring story. And I hope you enjoy it too. Let's get started. Hello, Kaylin. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Really excited to have you on for the audience or listeners. Not like I'm Oprah out here. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But I saw Kaylin, um, the Jiggy Puzzles on Thing Testing. And if you don't know Thing Testing, just search it on Instagram. But uh, it just reminded me, it was funny, I was talking to my mom on my uh, way home from, or yeah, on my way home from work. And I was like, yeah, it just reminds me of just doing puzzles with my grandmother, you know, up until she was like 95, she was doing puzzles and she would use that to connect us. So yeah, there's something special about puzzles. Good for your brain too. I'm sure it kept her, kept her young. Exactly. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, But before we get into Jiggy Puzzles, can you just tell the listeners a little bit about your background? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, am born and raised in California. I moved out to New York for college. I went to Barnard College in the city and studied political science. And um, my first job out of college was in management consulting. So I did the Monday to Thursday 
Wednesday consultant road warrior life for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and I worked on communication sector clients, a lot of media entertainment, um, consulting projects. And then I had gotten subscribed pretty early on to this at the time, new media startup called the skim daily email Mm -hmm. newsletter about the news and current events. And was just really interested in, in what they were doing. You know, there were hearing all the time and then about, you know, my peers, millennial generation, generally, um, you know, cord cutting and not watching, you know, cable news and not getting subscriptions to physical newspapers. And so how, what was this gap going to look like? How were millennials going to connect with current events, um, and the kind of changing media landscape. So I was really interested in that question generally and what the skin was doing to address it. And so I joined the co-founders, um, at the end of 2013 as their first employee. So that was my first, Mm. that kind of set me on this startup path. Path. Um, the consulting life is, you know, with a big firm and, and very corporate environment. Um, so didn't, didn't necessarily, you know, think of myself as a entrepreneurial or startup person, but it's just one of those beautiful time and place things, um, where the co-founders and I really hit it off and I decided to take the plunge and, and a jump on board as their first hire. And then that kind of set, set this path. So I ended up being there, um, through from seed through post our series B, um, you know, just crazy, the crazy kind of hockey stick (laughs) growth years and amazing, um, really scrappy, you know, building from scratch. Um, and that's ultimately, you know, so many lessons there to help actually start my own company. I can't imagine. And and for those of you out there who've never heard of this skim, you need to check it out because I'm <laughs> like, I'm not millennial. I'm like, right. Um, like, I'm like, there's a funny name for us because I'm like Gen X, but there's a name for the people who are specific years between like millennial right. and where Gen X meets. And that's kind right. of me. So, yeah. um, you know, even though I'm Gen X, I was all about the skim. I was like, I don't have time to be watching <laughs> news all day and yeah. night. Tell me what's important. I'll click totally. on it if I want some more details. I mean, it's so, I mean, I still subscribe to it now. Like it's, it's, it's so great because it's quick. It's easy. I mean, yeah. I feel like it's perfect for people on the go. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And that was really, um, you know, the, the, gap in the market that they saw and the the use case they wanted to serve of, you know, very smart, you know, driven, educated people who are just like, I'm not going to read, you know, cover to cover the paper, but like, I do care about what's going on and just like, tell me what I need to know. Um, and yeah, I think it, it, it certainly served the purpose of also like peaking curiosity, people who had never read the news before. I think if you you know, pick up a copy of the New York times, it sometimes assumes a level of prior knowledge and kind of jumps right into the story versus like, what if, what if this is your first time, you know, reading the newspaper? And so the skim, we really tried to, um, kind of provide all the context that you would need and like assume no prior knowledge and make it very accessible and digestible in that way. Mm, No, it's, I love it. Great. Thanks. I mean, to this day, for years, I've subscribed <laughs> to it. I was probably, like, there from the beginning. Um, Amazing. But so you get on this, and it's great, right? Because I felt like it just, it just like, took off. Because I've even seen mm-hmm. it kind of morph a little bit, you know, as mm-hmm. far as just, like, the formatting of it. And, yeah. you know, you know, you know, share it with others. So I'm sure you yeah. learned a lot about, like, the marketing aspects yes. of a new business. So what made you decide to start a business of your own? Like, at what point did you say, like, hmm, I have this idea. I think I want to do something. Yeah. You know, I think it's funny because I've kind of seen when I was in college and starting to, you know, on campus recruiting and thinking about what's next and kind of the sexy jobs were finance and consulting. And I think right 
you know, the last few years, it's taken a turn and kind of this sexy thing is like startups and entrepreneurship. And Mm -hmm. maybe just because I had that experience, (laughs) you know, pretty early on in my career, I was like, this is not sexy. This is not glamorous. (laughs) This is a lot of work, zero work-life balance for like not a lot of money, high risk, you know? So I, I didn't really like kind of, um, fantasize about, about being a founder and certainly didn't feel the need to like do it for the sake of it. But once I really just like had conviction in this idea and I was like, I, I, as a consumer want this to exist. And that's kind of how I've approached, you know, from the scam, I was a subscriber beforehand. And, you know, the approach with Jiggy was like, this is the product that I want to exist. I, you know, for reasons that we'll get into, like, I actually do think I'm the one to do it. Mm. And, um, and let's give it a go. And, you know, I, I would listen to all these, how I built this and different like Mm -hmm. founder (laughs) podcasts. And finally it just occurred. I was like, the only difference between like me and them is like, they just freaking did it, you know, like just deciding to pushing through those obstacles and just making it happen is, you know, if there's not some secret sauce, it's, you know, you maybe <laughs> I've lately, <laughs> a lot of my friends are having kids. So like this analogy comes to mind, but they're like, you're never going to be ready, you know, like right. to start a family, <laughs> but like you just do it. And so it took, I had been thinking on the idea and kind of wheels turning and just like, um, just, you know, doing some of the, the thought work behind it for, um, for maybe a year. Mm-hmm. And then finally I was like, all right, this is, this is time. Um, and again, like, you know, listening to these amazing inspirational and success stories is like, yeah, the only difference between having this idea and being a founder of this company is like, Mm. incorporate, make the LLC <laughs> and then like freaking do it. So like we're a company. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here we are. Um, well, yeah. I was going to just ask, you know, because of course there's like a billion product types out here, right? Like yeah. you could have did ceramic dishes or candles or, you know, frames, journals. What um, made you gravitate to puzzles? Yeah. So the like earliest kind of ideas. I mean, I had done puzzles as a kid with my family and like always had very kind of positive associations and memories of it. But like really most of my, you know, high school, college, early adult life, like wasn't actively puzzling, but it actually started when I was in those early days of the skim, which were incredible, all consuming, you know, amazing and stressful and all the things at once. And I was really looking for a way to just kind of be more present at the end of these long days and unwind. And it was right around, it was like 2014, 15, it was like headspace was blowing up. Everyone was talking about, Mm. you know, meditation, um, and having like a mindfulness habit. I was like, Oh, I should try that. So (laughs) I tried traditional meditation. It like didn't totally land. And, um, I was like, what am I doing wrong? And I somewhat randomly had a puzzle in like the games closet and, um, just was like, let me give this a try. And it clicked almost immediately. It was like this, first of all, there's no way to multitask. Cause it was the only <laughs> thing that like actually got me off my phone and computer, <laughs> not like, you know, half still doing an email, like no, you know, put away the screens. Um, and there was something really refreshing about just, you know, having one task, approaching it on such a micro level piece by piece, but then looking at the larger image. So it was like zoom in, zoom out, you know, have kind of this structured creation, um, of feeling like I was building something, but, um, but, you know, kind of less daunting than just like, here's a blank piece of paper, draw something, be creative. Right. Like it, it felt structured, but still a creative outlet. And I just found it really relaxing. So I started doing, I started doing a puzzle pretty much nightly when I was in those early, early stressful days of the skin and, um, really enjoyed it as my kind of form of meditation. But 
the designs themselves were just like so cheesy and you know it was like stock photography of like a cottage scene or like (laughs) like horses in a meadow (laughs) yeah I think one was like vintage stamps like you know it's just like total the art itself was like total throwaway and I was doing it for the the puzzling experience and I was like why can't it be both yeah Um, so this I this like idea planted, um, like five years ago. And I ended up being with the skin through 2017. Um, and then starting in 2018, I was like, okay, you know, the adult coloring book fad had happened. There were these like wine and paint nights. And I saw, I was like, there seems to be this appetite for like analog, activity and kind of, you know, just back to the basics and doing something with your hands. Um, and so I was like, Hmm, not only do I just want these puzzles to exist, but like maybe there's actually a business here. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. I mean, and I remember like even the puzzles I did with my grandmother and let me be clear just in case, like people um in my family are listening my great grandmother grandmother is still alive oh, <laughs> wow. it, like what happened no no, no. <laughs> grandma who's 85 what is alive and grandma? kicking but when my great grandmother while I was growing yeah. up was alive yeah the puzzles were just so like like you're right like you know like the the uh, towers or like meadows or things like that and then you would finish the puzzle and you're like well what are we doing with this you know you just crumble it back up right like okay we've just finished this thousand piece or two thousand piece puzzle but it's nothing to look at but we're just proud that we did it right and so yeah. for you you know when you're like okay there there seems to be this appetite for analog which I totally get because I'm like a bullet journaler because mm-hmm. I like that it forces me to get off the computer and like mm-hmm. plan my day and my week, you know, um, you know, with pen and paper, right? So you're right, like the last few years you see you we've seen more and more of that. And yeah. so you see that puzzles are the thing. So how did you decide like, okay, this is gonna be how I put my spin on it, right? Because there's like yeah. thousands of puzzles and yeah, yeah. multiple yeah, puzzle definitely. makers. So- yeah. I, um, you know, I started thinking, yeah, there are a couple ways to do this. Like, okay, maybe it's still, uh, maybe I just, you know, find better stock photography and stuff out there and just kind of slap a a better image on it. But I really wanted to kind of re reinvent the experience starting from, you know, kind of the, the presentation and unboxing and packaging and display. Um, also because, you know, when I was doing all these puzzles, they would end up in just like the dusty closet and mm-hmm. every puzzle ever made has come in that same rectangular box <laughs> yes. with the plastic bag inside. And so, I, I knew I wanted to reimagine the packaging. Um, and then for the design itself, it was a couple of things. One, I, to your point was like, what if when you're done with it, you actually enjoy looking at it? Like what Mm -hmm. then, you know, um, what if it actually, you know, when it's done, it's this whatever, 20 by 27 inch print essentially. Like what if it's actually something, um, that you would want to keep and display. So that kind of got me thinking on, you know, these can be real art and not only in the puzzling process where you're spending hours and hours with this design, wouldn't that be a better experience if you loved it and were noticing different detail and really appreciating the piece of art you were working on, but then it's done. And like, it's something that is beautiful that you want to, to keep and display, um, and decorate with. So Mm -hmm. I had the idea to use real art and, you know, at museum gift shops and stuff, there are some with, you know, the, the classics or, or, you know, art that's hanging on the wall of the museum. But I, um, really wanted to use and support, um, and help monetize, you know, emerging artists and their work, um, and female artists specifically. So I started going to art fairs and art shows in New York, you know, these kind of female illustrator communities online and on Instagram, um, and just started putting together, curating a, a group of pieces by emerging female artists that I thought would not only look beautiful when they were done, but also, of course, would you know, there was enough color 
color and detail and layers that you could actually like do the puzzle and it would be a good puzzle experience. And so curated the works, you know, reached out to the artist, told them what I was doing and working on, um, and licensed the pieces. So the artists get a percentage of every sale and, um, then went on to the packaging. And so wanted to, you know, both use cases of one, you, you do the puzzle and then you, you know, love it, but want to take it apart and back into its pieces, then, you know, could it still be displayed and on the bookshelf or coffee table in a beautiful way? And so the pieces, every jiggy puzzle, the pieces come in this, um, reusable glass jar with a cork lid so they can remain in, in their jar on the shelf, um, and a beautiful box that sits upright. Um, or if you want to preserve it in its completed puzzle form, each puzzle comes with puzzle glue. So once you're done, you just put the glue right on the top. It dries matte and clear, and it basically just gets in between the pieces and um, binds them. So it turns into like a completed print. And then you can Genius. keep it, <laughs> frame it, hang it. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to kind of put this whole kind of kit into um, – into each puzzle box and have it be more of an experience both in the, um, in the design and art, you know, way, and then also become actual decor once it's done. No. And, and I love that you're kind of giving back to like the artist too. Um, Oh yeah. And the art is beautiful. So for those of you all who are listening and not driving, definitely Mm -hmm. go to Jiggy Puzzles just to look at the different art because it is very different than the normal puzzles that you see. And there there is like this really beautiful illustrated artwork. And I like that you thought through like the packaging and the glue and, you know, like the whole experience. My question for you is, you know, once you have these ideas, like, right, because we all see, we have like these ideas in our head, like, oh my God, Mm -hmm. I could do this. I could see the glass jar and the cork (laughs) and the glue and right. But then most people are just like, yeah, well, that's, that's an idea. Right. But how did you like go about like, okay, this is where I'm going to get the glass jars. (laughs) This is where I'm going to get the puzzle. I mean, that's like. Like, I mean, huge. Yes. yes. <laughs> that that is huge. And that was certainly a journey, you know, with my background being in media and marketing, <laughs> the whole kind of physical procurement, supply chain, you yeah. know, manufacturing world was all new to me. But again, you know, I just kept coming back to, you know, the only thing between this existing and not is like my willingness to get over each hurdle and just make it happen. And so luckily through my time at the skim had, you know, built a good network of people based in New York and startups. And so tap my network asked for a ton of advice, started everywhere, basically on Google, like, yes, glass (laughs) jars that this size. Okay. But you know, I got, I just, with all the puzzles I had at home, you know, what, one liter, two liter, how many pieces can fit into what size. But like, I also want my pieces to be better and thicker and double-sided printing. So like, how does that, you know, all of this engineering, Mm. I ended up working with a freelancer who I found on LinkedIn. She went to the school of visual arts in New York and had done some product, uh, product design. And while I had a, a kind of vision for the end product, you know, getting from there point A to point B and actually having, you know, the CAD like design files that a factory could, uh, manufacture off of, I knew was something I needed help with. So, um, found her, worked with her on a freelance basis. Um, just, you know, went into like gift shops and boutiques that I went to for product discovery and just to get inspired by different branding and packaging. And yeah, I mean, manufacturing, there was like, it was not seamless. It was not like linear. (laughs) It was, it was so circuitous and fumbled my way through it. But, um, (laughs) I think, you know, just the, the, main manufacturing partner that I ended up working with ended up coming through a woman I went to college with her. We weren't even that close in college, but we reconnected afterwards. She had a high school friend whose 
dad he used to work in wow. book publishing and she was like puzzles are like car- like paper at the end of the day right like it's <laughs> right. cardstock so like they make books but like maybe they can do puzzles you know it was just one of those wow. um, one of those things so yeah I ended up finding this um great factory who like you know opposite of me like super professional have been in the business for a long time knew exactly what questions to ask and Um, so went into production last summer. Um, and yeah, it was definitely scary. The, I would say the biggest thing I was not prepared for were these minimum order quantities. And, you know, for example, the, the tube, uh, the, the aluminum tube I wanted, I went up so far out of my way to not use plastic. And so the, the tube that we have for the puzzle glue is aluminum. And so I found this supplier and, you know, the <laughs> minimum order quantity was 300,000 tubes. Whoa. Like, in what world am I going to make well, Who's going to use 000? that many, right? I know. It's like, so, this is not like you like a toothpaste company or something. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, figuring out like just creative problem solving and how to, you know, convince them to take me on. So, yeah, I think, you know, I wish there were like a simpler, pretty tied up in a bow answer, but you know, each step was just like, all right, you know, hunker down. How do we figure this one out? You know, after you left the skim in, in 17, did you get another job? So were you, are you doing this while working somewhere else? Yeah. So I started taking on projects on my own. So I started consulting with other media companies and startup on a project basis. So wasn't ready to dive into something full time. I knew that I, you know, ultimately wanted to start this company, but would take a while. And, um, in the meantime, wanted to, of course, be having an income, but also stay fresh and keep, keep my network building. So I got started my own consulting practice and took on projects. Um, so I was working with, say three to four companies, um, pretty much at any given time, all of 2018 and most of 2019 and Jiggy officially launched, um, fall of 2019. Mm. No, that is so exciting, but I just wanted, you know, to give people perspective too, because, you know, we have some people who are able to, for various reasons, like just quit and then be like, this is my full-time thing. I'm working on a day and night where others it's like, Actually, you know, like yeah. nights, weekends, <laughs> in in between time, you know, um, but but still, but you were still able to get it done. Yeah, I think it really depends on what, yeah, you and your circumstances, but also the the business. You know, I think for something that either is media or service based or software, that you might be able to just launch quickly with like, you know, an MVP and at least get to market and start iterating on it, potentially like bringing in some revenue, then maybe, you know, you can get to that stage a little quicker. For me, I really was potentially too precious, but I think ultimately (laughs) it paid off of, you know, just really making sure like, I was like, there is no real MVP equivalent for this. Like I want the first Mm -hmm. drop to be great and representative Mm -hmm. of the brand. And I think if you're, if you're, you know, a physical product consumer company and trying to build a brand and have it be at all, you know, aspirational or luxury or really kind of brand forward, I think it has to be good out of the gate. So I, I took more time to make sure that, you know, the, we went to market with a really strong product. So for that reason needed, you know, a year and a half of other income. Um, and yeah, I did that on a project basis. Yeah. And I feel like it, you know, because for those listening, they know I have a design background. So I'm like a really a nerd when it comes to design. <laughs> like, you know, one of my favorite stores is anthropology because I just feel like they, yes. whoever their buyer is, is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but this feels like to me, like an anthropology <laughs> type of product, right? Like the box is great. Like the, just how you thought through the glue and just, you know, working with artists and how it's so yeah. unique. So there's, it's oh, clearly you thought that. of it. Yeah. Like the brand story is there. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, as you're talking about it, I'm like, I can see 
all the love mm-hmm. that went into, you know, figuring out like the different elements. Yeah. So my, my question to you is, you know, we wrap up here is like, okay, so, you know, you figure out all the things like not ordering maybe 500,000 tubes, <laughs> <of> like, <laughs> right? <laughs> but marketing, right? Which is your jam, mm-hmm. right? You do mm-hmm. your, you know, marketing, like, how did you start marketing it and getting it out? Cause I saw like, even on Instagram, you, you have, it's like as seen on like Today Show and Domino Mm -hmm. Next and Real Simple. Mm -hmm. So how, like once you had that product, how did you say like, or how did you go about like really getting it out there to the world? So we launched right before the holidays, which was definitely helpful in Mm. that a lot of, you know, the major press outlets are looking for a product. So you don't really have to kind of create the behavior or, you know, invent the story. Like everyone's looking for unique, giftable new brands. So the timing definitely was intentional and such that, um, you know, at least the, the interest was there. Of course, we still had to do the outreach and, and pitch it well and tell our story, but just the availability and opportunity for, new products to be featured. I think the holidays is a great time to consider launching in that respect. And, you know, I really, I, I, I wasn't sure marketing wise how it was going to go just in terms of how much we needed to explain or educate or tell the story. It's been amazing to see just the response in that, like it clicks, it's resonating. People get it. They, you know, it's such a visual product. Sometimes Mm -hmm. they don't even know our story. They just see it. They're like, Oh, a beautiful artsy puzzle. Got it. Mm. Amazing. You know, like (laughs) clicks. Um, and you know, I read something, I think it was, you know, the, I forget his name, the famous Apple designer who's like, you know, the best products are the ones that need no explanation. And that Mm -hmm. I think, um, has, has been true thus far, but I do think the story behind it and the artists that we work with and, you know, the, the glue and the mindfulness and using it to, you know, get away from tech for a little while and unplug. I think all of that and the real story is, you know, makes ultimately, um, makes a difference and is what really builds the relationship with customers and, and is the real kind of core of, of building our brand. Mm -hmm. And so have just focused on trying to tell that, you know, across every channel, of course, when, you know, press will help you tell that story. That's amazing (laughs) and super helpful, but even just every Instagram post and story and email and, you know, in-person interaction. I think it's interesting now to see not necessarily like (laughs) the direct to consumer reckoning, but there is this kind of swing away from being too omni-channel. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, what does retail look like? What does that balance of, of e-commerce and D2C and traditional, you know, retail and wholesale, how do they all work together? How do you make sure that you're still telling the story at each and every touch point? So I think a lot about that and making sure that across all of our all of our consumer facing channels where we're telling our story and the artists helped you know i think oh right cuz they're like my products on a puzzle right. yeah. <laughs> they're they're excited to see it they're excited just to share what it is they get a percentage of every sale so they're incentivized to help sell and i think yeah it's fun to see them see them see people connecting with their work in a different way. I think it's one thing you look at it, you're like, Oh, beautiful image. But we're like, when you are studying each piece and you're like, Oh my God, this background layer of, you know, the, this design is like so intricate and, you know, it's, it's a new relationship that's formed between the artist and the customer doing the puzzle once they've been that intimately involved with it. So that's been really fun to see as well. And then for, for those out there, like who like, uh, like want to work with artists, is there mm-hmm. any, like an easy way where you can, cause you know, everybody likes kind of tools, softwares and tricks, but like yeah. an easy way where you could track, okay, I've sold X puzzle with the leafy illustration. So right, I know right. how much to pay. Cause I think sometimes that trips people up because they're like, well, how will I know how much to pay? And, right, you know, they right. get kind of caught in their head because they, they're not sure how to do that. 
Right. That, I mean, we, um, run on Shopify. So depending on what backend you use, um, there should be like analytics in place. We just run on Shopify and can, you know, check what data we want pulled into a report. And so on a quarterly basis can see the unit sold and, you know, the average price and then, um, percentages and get to it that way. But yeah, I think definitely whatever, you know, um, whatever e-commerce shop you're running on can certainly help with that. But Mm -hmm. I, I hope, you know, that there are tools out there. So I hope that that wouldn't be a deterrent because I think it's so important in seeing the impact, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, even our artists who, you know, might have a bunch of followers, like actually monetizing your work and selling prints and, you know, not just amassing some likes, you know, is still really (laughs) difficult. Um, and so I think it's, it's really important. And I was just talking to the National Museum of Women in the Arts in DC and they have this hashtag five female artists and it's so true. I'm now like, I'm challenging everyone. I'm like, can you name five female artists? And everyone's like, yeah. oh, of course. Like, Georgia O'Keeffe. Oh, um, I go way. Frida. Way. <laughs> like, uh, you know, and then it ends there. And so, um, yeah, I think anything to, to lift, I think versus, you know, some other or performance and music and writing, like visual art, I think female visual artists are still, um, still not recognized as much. So that's my, that's my soapbox. (laughs) Mm, No, I love it. Well, I'm just going to ask you a couple of wrap up questions. Yeah. Um, first one is how do you stay organized? Any tools, software or techniques that you could pass on to the audience? Yeah, I did like an email overhaul using superhuman. Um, Mm. and it, you know, previously my inbox, I had done like the mark on red was like my (laughs) to-do list and, (laughs) you know, just thinking superhuman helped me kind of have a new email workflow that, you know, the, the philosophy of like, one touch, like it comes in and either it's routed to where it needs to go or it's handled on the spot. Um, so that helped just like with kind of the, the lingering stress of always having a million on red emails. Um, and otherwise I'm with you, the physical planners and journals. Um, I need to like see my day written out, um, so I, I go analog for my planner, um, and kind of daily bullets. And then, um, yeah, I think figuring out my email system has probably been the most impactful change so far. Nice. And then, you know, normally I ask people, do you have a hobby? But I wanted to just switch <laughs> this one up because I asked my newsletter, list um last week what do they most struggle with and several Mm. people came back with how to stay motivated you know Mm. especially the people who are doing this while they have a full-time job they're like you know they wrote me like really nice emails and they're like yeah it's just so tiring you know I know like one day it's gonna happen but for you how do you stay motivated I think it's twofold I think one is one is like deeper and kind of intrinsic motivation and one is a little more superficial. I just try to come to it from a place of gratitude and just like how blessed and lucky I am to, for this to, you know, be what I get to do with Mm -hmm. my time. So I think just keeping perspective there of, you know, the, the options to the things that, you know, people around the world have to do to support themselves. And the fact that I get to do it and also love it, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just try to be grateful for that every day. And then, you know, on the, on just kind of the keeping the fire lit, I, (laughs) (laughs) I had this idea. I went on a family vacation in 2017 to Japan and I found an old fanny pack and I wore it or 2016 and I wore it the whole time. And I was like, fanny packs are amazing. Why does no one know this? Like my hands are free. My stuff is here. Like this is what men must feel like with pockets all the time. Like this is amazing. My shoulders are feel fine and relaxed. 
Anyway, so I was like, I'm going to bring fanny packs back. I didn't do anything with it. And like a year later, like, oh my God, like, it's insane. Like making fanny packs. And I was like, are you kidding me? And they even have like a fancy name for them, like belt bags. Like waist. Yes, yes, (laughs) yes, yes. yes. (laughs) Exactly. So, um, you know, I kind of had a similar, I was like, all right, fanny packs, I'll let that one slide. But like, (laughs) if I wake up one day and like, go online and there is a beautiful artsy puzzle and it is not mine. Like I will freak out and like this needs, like this needs to be me. I am the person to do this. And so that, you know, that initially just lit the fire of like, okay, create some urgency. Like now is the time. And, you know, even still, I'm like, yes, this is, I'm not the first one to make puzzles. Like this is something other people can do. And how do I make sure that like, I'm building a brand that, you know, is not easily replaceable and that Mm -hmm. makes an impact for our artists and for our customers and, um, you know, is, is here to stay. Oh, I love it. You hear that people (laughs) do it. There's nothing to it, but to do it. And if you're passionate about something, I tell people, you know, even, you know, for me, like I'm passionate about like this podcast, right? So I'm like, I go to work people every day and, you know, right now, you know, at least here in the DC area, it's 752 at night, but I, I don't mind it because I love talking to entrepreneurs like you, small business owners like you. And it excites me, um, because I know that like, the stories that I'm sharing are inspiring other women to follow their dreams. Right. And so it's like, you know, I'm going to do it nights and weekends, even when I'm tired, because I know it's making a difference and that's what keeps me motivated. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Well, perfect. Well, can you just tell the listeners like where to find you, you know, social media handles, websites, all the things. (laughs) We are Jiggy Puzzles all over the place. So JiggyPuzzles.com and Instagram and Facebook at Jiggy Puzzles. Um, yeah. So come find us, follow us, say hi. I'm pretty much a one woman show. So DM, it'll go right to me and yeah, say hi. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and sharing your story. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness. So what did you guys think of the episode? I think it was very inspiring. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please head on over to my Instagram account at Nishe Snow and leave a comment and and tell us what you guys think. I mean, I actually just bought one of her puzzles because I've been meaning to get a puzzle and I love her puzzle. Um, The Berlin Magalog is at least as of today, right before I post this episode, is still available. So get it while it's hot. It's um, It has the artwork of this amazing artist named Diana. And so I can't wait to get it. And it's a perfect COVID-19 exercise to do. So definitely check it out, get it for yourself or get it as a gift for someone. Anywho, I just think she took something that we're all familiar with it and she flipped it, right? She took it out of that boring cardboard box and put it into this beautiful um, just glass container. She made sure that the puzzle was like high quality, you know, really thick cardboard. Can't wait to touch and fill it. She made sure that she worked with emerging artists so you don't have like those old school kind of stuffy images you normally see on puzzles, but those cool images that you see and like on Instagram and want to frame. And she took it a step further, right? And has allowed you to frame it. The puzzle comes with glue and you can actually put a glue on there to kind of have it all stay together when you frame it. That is amazing. And she chose sizes um, where you can easily get like a frame online that fits the puzzle, you know, or you could go to your local Michaels or what have you. So just her thought process and how she wanted this 
to work, how she wanted the kit to be put together and just like the feeling she wanted it to evoke when people, you know, put it on their shelves to when they're actually working the puzzle to after the puzzle is done and actually using it as home decor was just very, very, very well done. And so my thing or message to you rather is if you have something that you know the world needs, figure out a way to do it. Nothing to it but to do it. Anyway, I hope this inspires you to do that little thing that's been nagging you, maybe for years, maybe for months, I don't know. But I hope you just do it. Anyway, thanks again for listening. Please give me uh, five stars on Apple Podcasts if you enjoyed this, a thumbs up on YouTube, and don't forget to check me out on Skillshare, blah, blah, Skillshare, slash Skillshare, and of course, the show notes for this page, nashaysnow.com slash 105. All right, you guys have a beautiful week. Hit me up on Instagram. Take care. Bye.